We're at the tail end and the final day of our thriving church series. What does a thriving church look like? And most of you don't know this, but we are celebrating today, this weekend, 22 years ago, this weekend, my wife and I and a small group of people planted Grace Church. We were at Penns Creek and the Adult Resource Center, and a few of us got together. There was about 100, 110 there that day, and then we quickly grew to about 50. Most of you didn't get that. We went from 110 to... But anyway, we, so God, but God was at work. And the amazing thing is that small group of people, we knew that God had put his finger on us. He knew, we knew that we had a vision. We knew that he, he said, I want you to go. And here's what he said. He, I want you to be different. And that's what we tried to be. Not that we're different, different, crazy, that we were just so, but we wanted to be a church for the unchurched. A church for where somebody who's hurting, somebody who doesn't know Jesus, somebody who's looking for hope, looking for, for help, can come and not face judgment and not face somebody who condemns them, but with open arms, somebody has, you found a home. That's what we were trying to create, a community of followers of Jesus who love Jesus. Not perfect, make a lot of mess ups, not doing it great all the time, but the one thing we hold on to is Jesus. So 22 years ago, we started this journey. Most of you haven't been here, but we've seen a lot of people come to know Jesus. We've baptized a lot of people. People have got healed, people have saved, people have delivered. And that's all a testimony to the faithfulness of Jesus. But it's part of being a thriving church. And I want to finish up our series today about talking about vision. But well, 22 years ago, Jesus gave us our vision of experience, connect, grow, and go. It's in your bulletin to experience him, to connect with one another, to grow in the Lord, and to go wherever he's planted us. But he's taken that vision over 22 years, and he's brought it, kind of funneled it down into four very important elements that we need to talk about today that you need to understand because this is who we are. This is who grace is. This is the thriving church that's before you. And it's not because we're so good. It's not that we have it all together and we found the sweet spot. It's because we've attempted for 22 years to listen to the Spirit of God. We've not always heard it perfectly. We've messed up at times. Big times. But God has been faithful. So I want to take you on this journey of vision, who we are. And if you choose to plant yourself here at Grace, then you need to understand this is who we are as a church. This is where we're heading. This is what he's calling us to. He wants us to be a thriving church, but he needs us to understand that it's not a church, a building, or you go to the church. It's that you are it. You see, the scripture says that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not in a building necessarily. It's in you. You are the church. So if you are the church, then we need to look, are you thriving? And these four elements that God has showed us a long time ago, he said, this is who I want you to be. I want you to lay it over your life and say, okay, how's my life lining up with this? The elements of a thriving church. Let's dig in. The first one is this, that he's called us to be a presence-based people. What does that mean? It's not about agendas. It's not about formulas. It's not about having all the right material and all the right things. It's about his presence above all things. It's not about doing everything right. It's not about having the music right and the speaking right. It's about his presence. You understand that? We're a presence-based people. In Acts chapter 3 is where we get this foundation from. Look at what it says. Friends, I realize that you and your leaders did to Jesus what was done in ignorance. He was saying, listen, I know you took Jesus and you persecuted him and you crushed him and you killed him. And a lot of it was done in ignorance. But God was simply fulfilling what the prophets had said a long time ago, that the Messiah must suffer the things that he did. Now he says this, I want you to repent of those things. Repent of the things in your life. Today he wants us to come to him and confess those things in our life that get in the way of him, get in the way of God, get in the way of our own thoughts that separate us from God. I want you to repent of them and turn to God so your sins can be wiped away, that there'll be nothing between you and God. That's what I want. And then something will be released. Look what it says, then. Say the word then. When you always see then in the scripture, you have to go back to what it said right before it. Because that's the key to it. The key to the then is what was before. What was before? Confession. What was before? Repentance. What was before? Getting your life right, your heart right before God. Then when you do that, what will happen? The time of refreshment will come from what? 
The presence. Not a formula. Not an agenda. Not a, a church growth seminar. But it will come from the presence of the Lord. You see, we're to be a presence-based people. Understanding the presence. Walking in the presence. Loving the presence. Desiring the presence. Asking for the presence. When you forget you're a presence-based people, then you go about doing whatever you want, how you want it. And that doesn't make for thriving anything. It makes for a very selfish church. It makes for some very selfish people. We need to be presence-based. That's our foundation. That's where we start. That's where Jesus has taken us after 22 years and says, here's what I want you to see blossom in the atmosphere of a thriving church, being presence-based. Now, this word presence, in Hebrew, it's called param. Param is the Hebrew word for presence, which really means face. In other words, he wants us to begin to seek God's face and the person of Jesus' face, not just for what he can do. See, when we first come to Jesus, we're like, oh, Jesus did this for me, and he did that for me, he took away my sin, and that's all great, that's all true. But somewhere along the line, there has to be a shift when we grow, right? A shift as we, we get a little bit more mature to where it's not just about what Jesus did for us and what he can do for us, but, but simply because it's Jesus. Do you understand that? That somewhere along the line, we have to go from, oh, Jesus does this, and I have this prayer need, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and I need this, and you have this long list. Of, somewhere along the line, as we grow up in him, we get to the point where we go like, you know what? Today, I, I just need him. Oh, I have a lot of other things. I just, I just want him. When you get to that point in your walk with him that you can gather together when we do with other followers of Jesus and you just pursue him, man, there's so much strength and power in that. Because you're not looking for everything he can give you. You're looking for his face. Just to seek after him. Hebrews 10 said this. So brothers and sisters, we can now come boldly. When you think of something that's bold, what do you think of? Something that doesn't stop, right? Something that's like, you can't hold that back. He says we're to come boldly and entering heaven's most holy place. Why? How? Because of the blood of Jesus. He's saying that now. He's not talking about then. He's saying right today, right now, if you're present space, you can come boldly before him to the most holy place. How? By the death of Jesus. Jesus opened the way. He opened the life-giving way through the curtain into the holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us now go what? Right into the what? Presence. He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about right now, come boldly before him, learning how to come boldly before him into his presence with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Because he's taken away and he's cleansed our conscience. He's sprinkled with Christ's blood. We've been washed. When you understand you've been washed and cleansed and clean, you can come boldly before him into his presence and you can go, ah. not just on a Sunday morning, but every day of the week, whenever you choose, you can come boldly before him into his presence. He wants you to be a presence-based person. He says, not only to be presence-based, I want you to be a word-focused people. A word-focused people. It's great to have the presence, but you know what? If you have the spirit without the word, you're going to be out of balance. Do you know that? If all you do is focus on spirit, 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 and you don't have the anchor of the word, you're going to be out of balance. The opposite of true. If all you have is the word, 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 and you have no spirit, you're going to be out of balance. So he wants us to be presence-based, but he also wants us to be word-focused. What's the power in that? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, look what it says. For the word of God is what? Say the word alive. It's alive and it's what? Powerful. The word itself is alive and powerful and it does something in you. It cuts to the very heart of the matter. It cuts between soul and spirit. Now, what is that? Spirit has been, the old has gone, the new has come. At the moment of salvation, your spirit is redeemed. Your spirit is saved. Your spirit comes alive. It's no longer dead. It's now alive. But what doesn't change? Your soul. You have to work at it. You have to work out your salvation and your soul. Your soul is where your thoughts and feelings, emotions have to be regenerated and renewed. And the word of God does that. It takes it right into that place and right into that selfishness and it hits right home and you go, ouch. That's what the word does. When, you, when you're in the word, 
even just a little bit, and you read and you go, man, there are days, there are times, can I confess something? There are days and times I read them, I'm like, ah, I don't like that. Have you ever been there? Have you ever picked up scripture and you go like, what? That's almost impossible. God goes, yeah. Now with me, it's possible. With you, yeah, it's impossible. Because you'll never be able to love like that without me. You'll never be able to forgive like that without me. You'll never be able to be cleansed like that without me. If you do it on your own, that's what you get. You're a little bit. But you do it with me. It's unlimited. For his word is powerful. It goes into the very innermost thoughts and desires of your heart. And it begins to mess with it. And if you allow him to mess with it, transformation and change will come. And you become word focused. Paul wrote to his spiritual son, Timothy. He wrote these. He said, all scripture is inspired by God. There's another translation that all scripture is God breathed. Isn't that neat? All scripture is God breathed. It's useful for you to teach us what is true. Now, I want to take a moment for this because we are living in a time right now that it's hard to know what is truth. But it wasn't so much different. 2,000 years ago, guess what? Jesus stood before a man named Pilate and Jesus was talking about the truth. And you know what Pilate said? What is truth? So even thousands of years ago, they were still battling what is truth. But we're living in a time where it is difficult to discern what is true because the media is saying one thing and politicians are saying another thing and we've got these two sides that are saying this. And sometimes even the church says this and then we have all of this going on and you can sit there and go like, what is truth? But if you're word focused, we can come to the word and allow the word and the spirit in you teach you what is true. And if the word says this is true and your thoughts and feelings are this, who are you going to believe? If the word says this is true and culture says this is, who are you going to believe? And if the word says something's true and your family says this is true, who are you going to believe? That's where it really hits. That's where it's hard and difficult. But there's help there. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. He uses it to prepare and equip his person, his people to do every good work. We have to be word-focused. We have to be presence-based, word-focused, and then we have to be spirit-led people. We have to know that the spirit within us is there for a specific purpose, more than teaching us. That's a huge thing. But it's also, he is there to lead you. He is there to guide you day in and day out. Not just Sunday morning when we hear him a little bit. Oh, yeah, I can really hear him on Sundays. Well, how about Tuesday afternoon? Does his voice get quiet? I don't think. You know what I think happens on Tuesday afternoon? Our ears get plugged. You know why? Because we're listening to crap. Can I say crap? I already did. Because we're listening to stuff that fills our heads. And the more we listen to stuff that fills our heads, then our mind gets going in a certain direction. And then what follows? Our heart and emotions. But if we're spirit-led people, he'll say, hey, turn that off. Turn that down. I have something for you. But you have to listen to him. Let me show you. Galatians chapter 5. Here's what Paul says. I want to tell you this, he says. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Then you'll be doing, you won't be doing what your spirit wants. See, we got the two opposite sides. We got what the spirit wants to do, and we got what you want to do. Here's where the battle is. Listen, can I confess something to you? At my core, I struggle with being selfish. Now, maybe none of you do. But I do big time sometimes. Because at my core, I want to do what I want. How I want. The comfort that it brings me. And I struggle with that. And I go rail against that. And the Spirit says, no, this. And then I say this. That's where the battle is in your life. The Spirit wants to lead you. But your own spirit wants to do what it wants to do. And there's a battle there. Here it is. The sinful nature wants to do what is evil. Your selfishness. Which is the opposite of what the spirit wants. The spirit gives us desires. The opposite of what the sinful nature wants. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not to, free out to do what you know you should do. But when you're directed by the spirit. There's a freedom there. When you're directed by the Spirit, He will guide you. He will lead you. He'll show you. you. Many can sit there and go like, well, I don't know what to say, but the Spirit says, I'll give you what you need at the moment you need it. See, we're thinking, our minds go, but I want it beforehand. 
right? God goes, no, I'll give it when you need it. Yes, God, but you don't understand. If I had it beforehand, then I'd be, no, I'll give it when you need it. See, we don't really trust him to come through. I mean, that's the bottom line. We don't really trust him to come through, even though he says he will. Being led by the Spirit. Romans 8, 14 says this, for all, say all. If you're there today, if you're in this, for all who are led by the Spirit are what? Children of God. Are you a child of God? If you are, you're being led by the Spirit. And here's the difficulty. Many of you are children of God, but struggle to be led by the Spirit. We all start there. We all have that thought. I, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm not sure how, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What does that sound like? That's okay to be there. You're in a good place. You, you'll grow. Don't stay there. Right? Don't stay in that place. Don't stay in that inadequacy. Don't stay there. But say, God, I want to learn. I do want to grow in you. I want to understand and I want to hear your spirit. But you can sit there. And unfortunately, I've seen this in 22 years. There are many who sit there and go like, nope, I know better. And then you know what? The spirit goes, oh, okay. Then you lead. We'll see how that turns out. And for some people, it's years till they discover well, that didn't turn out so well. Or their own spirit led them into places that they should have never went. And we've seen lives destroyed and marriages destroyed and parents broken up. And we've even seen churches split up all because people have been led by their own spirit versus led by the Holy Spirit. He wants you to be presence-based, word-focused, and spirit-led. And finally, he wants us to cap it all off by this thing. He wants you to be a worship always people. Why? Why is worship so important? Because worship is the, some of the, one of the most powerful weapons that will break things in your life when you learn how to worship. And worship, we've said this for 22 years, worship has nothing to do with the band. As good as it may be, it has nothing to do with what's on the screen. Worship has everything to do with your daily life, seeing God at work in the small things and the big things and the medium things and going, God, you're good today. When you wake up and there's a sunrise, you go, that's kind of neat, God. Now, I confess, I don't see a whole lot of sunrises. I see a sunset every day. I'm pretty good at that. Sunrise, yeah. But when I do... Often I'll go, God, why am I up? Or sometimes I'll go, God, thanks, I'm up. But you can worship. And you've got to choose to worship when you're going to work, when you're way home for work, when you're at work. We need to learn to worship. When you're going to school, all of those, when you're doing the dishes, when you're doing the dishes, don't say, oh, God, say, oh, God. <laughs> and there's a big difference, isn't there? Or maybe you just are, Lord, I'm so thankful that you gave us a dishwasher. Right? Yeah, you can be amen in that, right? Yeah. Technology, it's okay. Okay? But we need to learn to be worship all these people. What does this mean? Hebrews 13, look what it says. It says, therefore, let us offer, what is offer? You're giving something of yours, right? Let us offer to Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise. Proclaiming our allegiance to his name. We say, saying about the name of Jesus, the power of Jesus, what Jesus' name can do. We are to offer a sacrifice of praise to Jesus continually. That has nothing to do with words on the screen. It has everything to do with your heart. Psalm 34 says, I will praise the Lord at all times. When? When you're feeling it? When you're feeling good? When things are going good? When the traffic's moving? When everybody gets out of your way? All the times. I get guilty of that sometimes. I don't know how many times. If I had a dollar, if my wife had a dollar, she'd be rich. Every time I said, if these people would just get out of my way. <laughs> I'm not being led by the Spirit. I understand. But we are to praise Him at all times. I will constantly speak His praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. See, there's a key there. If you're struggling, if you're going through a rough time, rough day, rough situation, it can seem helpless. But guess what is the opposite, worship? Worship will break the spirit of heaviness. 
If you're feeling down, feeling low, feeling depressed, feeling anxiety, situations hurt, begin to worship. Worship does it. Worship lifts up your head. It takes you from here, my situation, to there, who he is. Brian, you can come. Let's finish with this. Psalm 34, verse 3. Look what it says. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. That's worship. You see it? Worship is telling somebody about the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt the name together. Now, I want to finish with this. There was a guy named David who wrote many of the Psalms. If you want to be encouraged, well, Psalms does one of two things. You can read Psalms and you can go like, whoa, that guy had problems. He did. He had a lot of problems. But Psalms is also a place where he got really encouraged. And I love the one Psalm where he said this, praise the Lord, I tell myself. Now, what, did it, what was he talking about? David was in a place where he knew truth. He was angered in truth, but he couldn't see it anywhere around him. All around him was chaos. All around him was hurt. All around him was people that didn't like him. All around him was situations he didn't like. So he had to stand there and go like, um, praise the Lord, I tell myself. There are days that you're going to have to learn to look in the mirror when no one's around and go, praise the Lord, I tell myself. Because there ain't nobody else that's going to do it for you. So you have to do it. And when you begin to praise the Lord yourself, something will break. Something will change. Praise the Lord, I tell myself. That's what David discovered. The power of worship. Of worship always people. So who are we? What's our vision? Who are we to be? To be? We're to be present-based, word-focused, spirit-led, and worship always. As we do that, God says, I'll breathe upon it. I'll take your inadequacies, I'll take what you lack, and I'll breathe myself on it, and it'll become more than enough. It's time that we, as the, the body of Christ and the church of Jesus Christ, move from living in a land of not enough to a land of more than enough. Because that's who Jesus is. You get it? The land of not enough was in Egypt. When the whole nation was there, they never had enough. God brought them out of Egypt, and they were for 40 years they were wandering. They were living in the land of just enough. He gave them every day. That's all they needed. But he had promised them a land of more than enough. Their promised land. And that's what he wants for you. The land of more than enough. Not maybe your bank account, but right in here where it counts. A sound mind. An overflowing heart. That's what he has for you, the abundant life. Okay? I want to pray for you. Stand to your feet. I want to just pray and just this word, this, this abundant, thriving church, that's who you are. Listen, I encourage you for 22 years, you are the church. Go be the church. Go love on people around you. And I want to pray that over you. Lord, I thank you for your word over us, for your heart over us, for your vision over us. And Lord, I thank you for 22 years. You called us in this community. You brought us out of different places and you set us here and you said, I want you to create a place where the unlikely and the unlovely can come and be accepted and be loved. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done. And Lord, we thank you for what you are doing. And Lord, I want to thank you for what you will do. So Lord, take this word, make it just deepen it in the hearts of people to be a thriving church. The vision of who you are in us and through us. So Lord, just may it settle in on them. And bless them with yourself. In Jesus' name. Amen.